So the, the title of my talk is uh, Stay What Is Window. Building a Survival Protocol for a Corrosive Digital Environment. How could a digital environment be corrosive? Obviously, we have to make it be corrosive. Why would we want to make a digital environment corrosive? The whole point of a digital environment <laughs> is that it's completely stable. It is that nothing ever changes. And so the big picture that I want to leave you with is that the purpose of this research, the goal of this research, is to say if we are going to move to much, much larger scales of computation, which I believe we are, we are going to have to give up on our most cherished assumption of digital computing, which is hardware determinism. We're going to have to give up on the idea that the hardware is guaranteeing to do exactly the same thing every single time, no matter how long we run the program, no matter how much memory we use. And if we do that, we are going to have changes, degradations happening inside our software. And we're going to have to deal with that somehow. And the best way that I can think of to deal with that is to deal with that up front. Suppose we build in corrosion. Suppose we build in an inherent mechanism that's tearing stuff down and ask, can we design software structures that will be robust in the face of that? And that's what I'm trying to do here. Okay? So I have a famous history of not being able to shut up. Uh, uh, so the only safe thing to do is begin with the conclusions. <laughs> so here they are. Uh, uh, traditional digital computing is ultimately unscalable and unsecurable. I already touched on that just a little bit. Uh, best effort computing is the alternative I'm proposing. The hardware does not guarantee to be 100% repeatable. It will try. It will try as hard as it can to get the same answer for the same inputs and the same instruction, but it doesn't guarantee to do it. If it fails to do that, software cannot complain. Software should have been covering its own access. Best effort computing offers inherent robustness and indefinite scalability. Once we give up on this idea that everything is going to be completely synchronous, ka chung, ka chung, ka chung, ka chung, and there will not be a failure anywhere in the universe, we in fact now can build computers of arbitrary size. Any actual machine is not infinite in size because infinity does not exist, but we can make any finite size that we like, and in fact we can keep on adding stuff while we're using it. All right? And so we're actually working on building that. This here is a T2 tile. This is one of a unit of computing. It's got six connections uh, around it. And the idea is you take these little inner tile connectors, and if I can get it oriented right, you stick it into one edge, and now you can put another tile next to it, another tile next to it, you get a whole row. Up on top, they're staggered, offset, so you end up making a brick wall. These things share power, they share data. We have north of 150 of these now built, waiting for software loads. How much? How much money? Does it cost to make them work? Not counting my time at zero, it's somewhere on the order of $150 a pop. Okay. Uh, Your time is not zero, right? Say, well, <laughs> I chose, right? Uh, okay, it, you make 10. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, uh, if you can show me that you will use that, we should talk. Uh, uh, and I'll circle back around to that at the end of the talk as far as where we want to be moving in, in the next year, where we want to be moving down the road. Okay? Yeah, um, so, uh, uh, artificial life, this is why the reason I'm speaking here. Yeah. Uh, artificial life can and should be the way in best effort multicellular programming. My claim is we are essentially going to recapitulate in a dot digital stylized form much of the history of the evolution of life in order to build up this new computational stack to deal with best effort hardware. Living systems never had the guarantee that everything was going to be perfect. They always had to deal with everything going on. And we're going to do the same. And the design solutions we're going to get to, things like cells, things like cells that reproduce uh, uh, for robustness, for performance, to fill available resources, that same thing is going to happen in our digital systems. Like that. Okay? <laughs> so, the specific work I'm talking about today is called the C214 protocell. 
a year ago in Tokyo, I presented the C211 protocell. Uh, this is three numbers better, uh, and I'll explain to you what the difference is uh, between C211 and C214. There's a lot more left to do. All right. So today I want to introduce the idea of software living technology. Living technology versus artificial life. Living technology versus artificial life. What's the difference supposed to be? Living technology actually cares about being useful for society. Uh, so that someday, somebody might even pay for it. Uh, uh, it doesn't? No, I don't think it has to, does it? The, the, what, what makes it anything different than an artificial life simulation? We can debate that question. <laughs> I'm, 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 I, I was going with Mark Bedos. I was coming to criticize you, but then you told me Affinity doesn't exist, and you're instantly my friend. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, so the slogan is Infinity is brain damage. Uh, so we may we may think it exists, but the, the, the we need to look at ourselves. We really are. Uh, 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 all right. Uh, um, so I suggest that we we have a, not just a scientific interest in exploring the meaning of life and using digital systems to make models of life, all of that stuff we have an additional obligation to society to help develop new computational architecture that will scale better than CPU and RAM and hardware determinism, and it will not suck at computer security like <laughs> CPU and RAM and hardware determinism manifestly does. Okay? And so that's the goal. So uh, today, do this. Oh, and then the outlook going forward is for next year uh, at the A Life 2020 conference. We want to have 150 or more of these in a grid, maybe two meters by a meter and a half, on the wall, in the lobby, or we're negotiating, we're talking with the conference organizers as we speak. And I would really love it to be running your code. Uh, uh, all right. Uh, uh, so, the big picture is there's at least two big attractors, two whole styles of computation, and they couldn't be more different. I'm not going to go through every box on this thing, but roughly the middle column is what we have today. We focus on algorithms, getting from input to output. The important point, number one, the algorithm must be correct. Uh, given that it's correct, we want to be as efficient as possible, and yes, we want to be as robust as necessary once we put it out in the field. And what I suggest that alter the alternate approach, what I'm calling the indefinitely scalable approach, just rotates that one step. We're going to say it must be robust. In other words, it must put up with whatever challenges get thrown at it in its typical environment. Given that it's robust, it should be as correct as possible. Yeah, it should try to get the right answer. That's not the most important point. But it's a very important point. And then finally, it should be as efficient as necessary. Okay? That's the, that's the change in mentality. First be robust. Then as correct as possible and as efficient as necessary. Both get the same things. They just have a different set of emphases that lead to very different architectural designs, as suggested by all the other uh, rows of this table. And again, what we have today, the slogan is, master of the universe. The programmer is God. Nothing happens except what the programmer says. The programmer can write something to memory on step one and read it back on step one trillion, and it must be the same. The indefinitely scalable process is there's going to be many, many similar things trying to cover for each other or compete to do the results, whatever it may be. It's member of the team versus master of the universe. Okay? All right. And again, this is not <coughs> me saying this. Everybody in a computer science talk needs to have the von Neumann picture, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, there's a few others, but they're not as good. Uh, um, and in 1948, he was saying, you know, we're going to have to move beyond hardware determinism. We're going to have to build a model that allows malfunctions with low probabilities. We're going to have to care about how long the program is. That's crazy. And now it's been pushing 80 years, 70 years since he said this, and we're still doing it the same way. We haven't listened to him. 
So I feel like what I'm trying to do is affirmative action for what von Neumann said we should have done seven, long, seven decades ago, something like that. And there's obvious reasons why we haven't done it. It's hard. And we have all of these design assumptions, hardware determinism, binary numbers, universal computation at a very low level. All of these design decisions interact and support each other and resist giving up on determinism. And if we give up on determinism, we have to give up on stuff that we didn't even imagine was an assumption. We thought it was obvious. There was no other choice. There are other choices. All right. So what I figured out, only took a decade or so, was that instead of just saying the current model of computing is bad and wrong, we need to come up with an alternative model of computing that's good and right that we can head toward rather than just heading away from where we are. Because there's way too many directions away from where we are. And the suggestion is we should head towards architectures that are indefinitely scalable. That they never run out of RAM, they never, that they can't have a single CPU because you can only fit so much stuff in the light cone surrounding a single CPU. Period. Just as a matter of physics. Okay? So if you take this really seriously, if we're going to come up with a computer architecture that we can grow to arbitrary size without ever saying, whoops, 640K of RAM, we're done. Whoops, 64 bit address space, we're done. If you can think of architectures that have none of those limits, that's what indefinite scalability is about. That's what the T2 tile exemplifies. And that's what I believe is sufficient to drive the development of artificial life for useful computation for the benefit of society. So, all right. Now, um, we need <coughs> kind of an entirely new computational set. So that's why this research project has taken a little while. Uh, uh, we've made a ton of progress. But really, the idea is artificial chemistry is the physics, which is why I was saying, you know, so you imagine making some level of commitment to saying, this is the kind of state transitions we're going to support. We'll build in some kind of programmability. Some kind of customers you know, can say, well, I want elements that make things grow bigger, or I want elements that make stuff look like flowers, or whatever the heck it is, and they could have that. But then even that is going to be sort of firmware level. We're going to control access to changing it. And then above that, we'll have the sort of chemistry level, where it's just reactions happening, and that will be relatively a free-for-all within the rules defined by the physics, within the rules defined by the chemistry. Our architecture is this non-deterministic distributed architecture. Why is it not deterministic and distributed? Because it definitely scalable forces us to give up on determinism and to give up on central processing. Right? So that's how these things work together. So local state transitions, so spatially distributed. This guy says, I want to do something. He looks at his spatially local neighborhood and says, well, given where I am now, I want to do swap these two guys and change to blue or whatever it is. And they do it. So those local state transitions is our programming model. That's what we have to do. We have to figure out how to develop a number of elements and give them state transition rules. And from one level, now it's just a software problem. Uh, 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 like, like all software problems are just software problems, yes. Uh, but it's worth your life to actually try to get it right. And in fact, you have to try stuff because you don't understand how the interactions between one set of decisions you made are going to work in the context of all the other decisions you made. And that's just as true with traditional computing. It's just normally you have this much bigger chunk of where you believe you're God, where everything does what you say it does. Before you get to input and output, and now you deal with somebody else's stupid assumptions, and the whole thing goes down. <laughs> so, artificial chemistry to artificial biochemistry when we get to these sort of proto-cells that we can now start doing a higher level organization and instead of thinking in terms of atoms and molecules, we'll think in terms of cells and multicellular organizations and we'll go on up. All right. Okay, so 
This is called the event window. This is what the world looks like to an individual atom. It sits in the middle at site zero. When it's its turn to go, its transition rule is going to look at any of those 41 sites, including itself, make any decision it likes, and update that window, not just itself, but rewrite the window however it likes in its image. Well, rewriting in its image is not a good idea. That would tend to be cancerous. Yeah, um, but this is it. This is all that a local element gets to see to make its transition. All right? Okay, so how are we going to make these transitions? I mean, obviously, this grid-like layout feels like a cellular automata. It seems like a cellular automata. And it is a cellular automata, but it's not a conventional one. It's not synchronous, and there's no guarantee of determinism. And what we do instead is we pick a random site and say, okay, it's your turn, go, okay, it's your turn, go, okay, it's your turn, go. And there can be zillions of individual sites going on at the same time, as long as none of the event windows overlap. All right? So the way, we cannot write a state transition table for this. There's, there's something like uh, a thousand, several thousand bits of state here, so the transition table would have two to the, two to the, thousand rows of the table. Uh, um, so instead we write code, we write programming language code, we develop languages to help us do that. This is a snippet from a, a program uh, that defines an element called swap line, written in the language Ulam, which we presented two years ago, three years ago, something like that. Okay? And you can, you know, even without knowing Ulam, Ulam was deliberately designed to look reasonably familiar. Uh, four loops, I get it. Uh, uh, site nums, so those are the, the points in the event window. So it's a loop that's looking over the uh, event window and making some kind of decision. Getting the coordinates, it's greater than zero, and so on. And checking each atom to see, is it a swap line? And the goal of the swap line mechanism is you have a vertical line that's heading east. But since it's not synchronous, the thing is not going to go chunk, 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 chunk. One guy is going to get it to go before the others. So he moves ahead. And the idea of a swap line is he looks at everybody who is behind him to see, are there any swap lines around me that haven't caught up with me? And if so, I'll just wait. So what, what ends up happening is whoever happens to be the back man works his way forward, and then the line goes forward. So what you see is this raggedy line gradually moving east, never going more than a 45 degree angle like that. Okay? And the swap line ends up being useful as a component of many other uh, more complicated molecular systems that we have built uh, up through and including this uh, thing that, that reproduces arbitrary objects by passing swap lines through it and copying the line when it finds it. This is a lot of code to express that. It works. It's good. But since then, we've developed a second language, again, which was presented last year, called SPLAT, that is based on spatial patterns rather than traditional sequential code. So here's the same program whoops, uh, um, written in SPLAT. Uh, it's an element swap line, same thing, same color, same symbol. These are rules. Left-hand side, arrow, right-hand side. What's S? Well, S is a site that has a swap line in it. So if we have a swap line, an at sign always represents me. So if I have a swap line to my left, I can replace it with empty to my left and me. Dot means leave that site alone. Don't change it. So the net effect is that if I have multiple swap lines in a given row, they compress down to just one. Because that's really not supposed to happen. We really wanted to have an individual guy moving down. But then here's the trick. Hear me, if I have a swap line behind me above or a swap line below me, I do nothing. I don't change it, I don't change it, I don't change it. What good does that do? What good does that do is the fact that this rule matched means the event is over. The way SPLAT works is it considers the rules one at a time and the first one that succeeds, that's the end of the event. So if we have a, a lagging swap line, this matches and we're done. If not, me followed by anything turns into anything followed by me. All right? So it accomplishes the same thing, but it's much 
more concise, and it gets at the spatial relationships that traditional programming languages really are bad at. So that's it. So we take a big leap from swap line to the C211 memory. This is what I presented last year in Tokyo. Each of these things is a protocell. It has a light blue inner membrane, a darker blue outer membrane, and a bunch of goo inside. Uh, and you let this thing run, and these things vibrate and move around and tear each other into parts, called reproduction, and, and so forth. All right. Now, in particular, these guys were really messed up, and they had some uncontrolled growth problems. So eventually, the world ended up being filled with this seething cauldron of Jabba the Hutt cellness, uh, uh, just because of bugs. All that stuff could have been fixed in principle if need be, but there were other issues with the C211 membrane that we wanted to address instead. And I'm running up short on time, so I'm going to rush on ahead. Two of the issues were the C211 membrane existed in a vacuum. The world was completely empty except for other cells. And the goo on the inside, that cancerous goo, was not very useful for making future additional more complex computations. So we have changed in the 214 model to adopt this corrosive environment. We have these elements called DREG, which stands for dynamic regulator. And without going into the details, dynamic regulator is empowered to erase stuff next to it, no matter what it is. It rolls a random number, and if it's just feeling like your number comes up, you're gone. Doesn't care whether you're part of a cell membrane, doesn't care if you're the prettiest cell, whatever, you're gone. And the rest of the computation has to handle it. That's the corrosive environment. Why don't we just kill off all the dreg? Well, because the other thing dreg does is generate res, resource atoms. And that's the only way that resource atoms are created. So if you give up on the drag to get safety, you have no resources. So we tie creation and destruction together in one element called drag. All right? And so that's the model that we've lived in. These are the drag reactions. We don't need the details. And then there's the three-step development. These are just three engineering improvements that we discovered when we put C211 in a world full of drag and watched what happened. Uh, um, and it, it wasn't great. C211 was not prepared to deal with it. Uh, it turned out there were a variety of cases. <coughs> I am inner membrane, OM outer membrane. There's supposed to be an invariant that uh, I am should always be surrounded by OM. And that invariant is violated here. Why? Because Drake came along and chewed off a little bit of it. But it turned out because the rule for C211 wasn't expected yet, this was a, a pinning state. So the whole rest of the cell started flailing around this one little spot that never moved. So there were several things like that that we had to fix. Uh, but in addition, we wanted to say, how can we do it even better? And we come up with this idea, well, you know, in the dreg physics, it's a sin to kill a dreg. You're not allowed to erase a dreg. Nothing stops you from doing it. But if you happen to erase the last drag, you just killed the universe. So it's a sin to kill a drag. But that doesn't mean you can't push them away. So here we have a rule. This guy is an outer membrane, and he looks for dregs anywhere in here, and he looks for empty spaces out here. If he finds it, he pushes the drag further away. And it works great. It improves the survivability of the cell membrane a lot. And we took that one step further, and again, you can read about all this in the paper, where in addition, now the cell membrane deploys cilia, little atoms that float around outside the cell membrane and act as patrols. And when they see dreg, they use the, the cell membrane themselves and the dreg to figure out a line, which way should I push the dreg to get it further away from the cell membrane. And that works great. And here is our results. Uh, uh, this is a survival graph. 100% <coughs> means all the runs were still going at that point. And then the original C211 is the solid line grouping down here, pointing to a median survival rate. 50% of the population was still surviving at 
thousand events, and so forth. And funds so are our C214, more than half of the populations were still surviving, more than half of the individuals, excuse me, one cell in each run, uh, uh, were still surviving by the time we got to 500,000 events, which is where we stopped. So we got better than a 10 time increase in the survivability. And I'm out of time, so why don't I, uh, why don't I just show this while we take one question and we'll let other folks set up. Uh, um, in any case, thank you so much for listening. So the idea is you're going to have a layering of stuff that is extremely hard to change, like the hardware, uh, and stuff that's fairly hard to change, and that's going to be the laws of physics. They're actually running out of firmware, they're running out of flash, and so forth. And so can that program get corrupted? It absolutely can. Uh, at the moment, all we have to fall back on is to invalidate ourselves, reboot, and we will then take the <laughs> copy from our neighbors uh, automatically because of the way the system works for sharing content. But there's no one solution to that. You've got to keep solving it again at each level, and that's the way it ought to be. Hi, really interesting stuff. Um, I'm not really a, an A-life person, and I'm kind of new to this, but um, um, if you're modeling essentially analog processes and you're interested in stochasticity, why don't you use analog computing? I, I don't think analog and stochastic are welded together. You don't need to use analog to use probabilistic or non-deterministic stuff. And for me, the distinction between digital and analog is totally a matter of degree. If you take digital stuff like this and say, like, you know, these brown spots, these are resource atoms. Yeah, except that you're spending a huge amount of energy you know, shoveling between knots and wands. Yes, and, and, and when you see how hot these things get, yeah. you say, yeah, absolutely. And, and my response is, once we know what we want, we can optimize for energy costs. And we can optimize much harder than we can right now because we can tolerate some degree of error. But by going all the way to analog, we have to then build back in digital-like recovery mechanisms to manage the error. So it's going to go one way or the other. Okay. Thank you. Any last question? Just a quickie. Um, yeah. I'm sorry, I came in late. I'm at another conference as well, so I'm going to take a conference. Um, I really like this. This is a better conference. <laughs> 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 Just in my talk at the other conference, and they are. <laughs> 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 so that's the best compliment I can Alrighty, give. Alrighty, thank you. So I'm interested in making chemical computers, but not simulations of them. Yeah, literally chemical. Literally chemical yeah. computers, but I want to use cells because I have addressability. But I love the fact that uh, you're mentioning the need to go in synchronous. Anyway, I'll cut to the point. Can we throw out your, let's imagine when we throw out your actual the computation being done in the CPU and instead use your architecture to address a cellular grid. And a bit like Alan's question, we actually embody the computation chemically in yes. a, the, basically yes. a jelly. And can we use your system to interface that and program the cells? It would be so that the, the, the glib answer is yes. No, I'm, 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 I'm not interested in doing that. I, I am not interested in doing that anytime soon. Because the impedance match, the amount of hardware you would have to provide me, the amount of physics you would have to provide me. Let's say me. I have that already. And all I did and I, you have arbitrary nonlinear mappings of state to state yeah. that we can do locally. Yeah. I would love to say, could we pop this digital stuff out and put goo in? Yeah. Okay. I, I think there's a reason to yeah. want to keep digital, but for sure. All right, I've used more than my time. But.